So I'm Donna McDaniel, and I do live in Southboro, and I have for quite a long time, though I'm not a native. <coughs> and um, I was, I was just saying informally, I was a history major in college after I discovered that psychology wasn't giving me what I needed to know about why people are the way they are. I'm not sure that history answers those questions, but it certainly gives lots of things to think about. So I really loved it. and. Um, uh, so I taught social studies for a while, that's what you do after you get out of college, you become a school teacher. And I got a degree in guidance, so I was a counselor after a while. And then um, I decided at a certain point, without doing all the details, that, that I really didn't want to teach history anymore. And after I taught it in college, so I taught teachers of history in college. So I had a chance, I moved to Southboro with my husband and two kids and there was an ad in the paper, I needed to get a job, an ad in the paper that said, work at home and write about your local government. I thought, gosh, that sounds kind of interesting. So I became a reporter for the then Metro South Middlesex Daily News and I loved it, I just loved it. I, I, loved, I was very committed to local government and to that and I, um, so I did that for six years until the news changed enough so that when I used to have a whole section of things that we could have about Southboro, they started covering other towns and so Southboro started getting down like this. And, um, and I just felt like I couldn't do the job that I've been doing. So I left and I've done any number of other things since. But, but the local government is just as much a part of the history as it is, uh, for me anyway. So I hope that when when the election comes, we have two elections. You have a town election and then that other election. <laughs> um, so I hope that, that the women will show up. I always write a column beforehand saying, there are women who died for your right to go to the polls. So at least you could do is get over, take the 15 minutes it gets to get over there. So we'll see about these women, and indeed some of them did, did die. Um, so this this picture is obviously a woman who's being dragged unceremoniously and apparently with some great discomfort by these bobbies. Um, the part of the point of this is that the British women were just as active in the women's suffrage movement as we were, perhaps a little ahead. I don't really remember that part. But th the idea that you'd be in this <coughs> very British looking place and you know so dignified and they're dragging this woman out and she's in pain. Uh, in, in London as well as in New York there you'll see pictures of parades and the women would indeed get arrested too and dragged off and had other things happening. Um, so this, this I thought was a good introduction. Um, John Stuart Mill, we are continually told that civilization and Christianity, well you can read it yourself I'm sure, but Meanwhile, the wife is actual bond servant of her husband. That's pretty strong language. And as it says below, um, Mill was in, uh, in Parliament, tried to get a proposal so that women would be allowed to vote. And um, the part that I appreciated there <laughs> for what it means was when he tried to call women a person instead of a man and therefore allow them to vote the people in the House of Commons laughed. So that's about where they were at the end of the 1800s. So um, I think, is it, well, are these the ones that I didn't have the thing for? Yeah. Oh, all right. So um, these two, the, the women you'll see, one of the, one of the major points of this whole thing is they were much more sophisticated than we might have thought would be happening and they were, as we saw, they had newspapers, they had posters, they had protests, they were writing back and forth to England, supporting each other and to other places. And when you think that this is the, around the turn of the century, meaning the 1800s to the 1900s, you didn't send emails, you didn't pick up the phone, you didn't do all these things and yet somehow, uh, the same was true with the abolitionists who were forever communicating with England. You write a letter and a couple weeks later it gets there and a couple more weeks it get, gets back. I mean, we just can't imagine planning anything that way. But they were in constant communication. 
And even to as far as Oklahoma, there were women, and in this particular case, colored women, as they said, um, who were also trying not only for, they want, they'd like to be a citizen too, as well as be able to write, to vote. Uh, and one of their ex, one of their mottos, which I really liked a lot, was they were climbing, they were trying to climb up into a place where they wanted to be that was much better for them, much more democratic, fair and everything. But they also were very aware that they were lifting the next generation. That's what they meant when they said, and lifting as we climb. They saw themselves as lifting up their offspring so that they would have a better life where they had the kind of rights that we presume they were supposed to have. Um, Mr. President, who would, does anybody want to guess which president around 1900 or so? Well, this I, is, um, it, it could have been two, but I think it's Wilson, Woodrow Wilson was the president. He was not a very egalitarian person, let's put it that way. So, and here are some of the women. I can't really, we can, we'll have to imagine what it says on their signs, but, so, okay. Missouri, I think. Oh, really? Yeah, and it says Stanford. Oh, great. So these were college women who, yeah. I'm guessing they came to Washington because there's that kind of iron fence behind them and the other pictures have the first picket line at the White House was presumably one of these groups of women who were standing there. So they, I think that's where they were. We'll see that again. So, okay. I got this picture for the hats, actually. <laughs> it is the executive board of one of the, there are several associations, the National Women's Suffrage Association, et cetera. And so <coughs> it was the executive board. Uh, but I just, the, the hats were incredibly wonderful. And I think this is one of the leading characters. I'm not sure if it's Elizabeth Cady Stanton or one of the, we'll see in a minute. Uh, in fact, I was going to ask you, do you have any names from your past that you associate with women's suffrage with winning the right to vote? Susan B. Anthony, Susan B. Anthony. yeah, was definitely a, a leader and was from Adams. He was, she was born in Adams and she was also a Quaker. Um, a couple, I'm a Quaker and a couple of us here may be, I won't. And, um, the, the interesting thing about Quakers is not that they were Quaker, but that Quakers always treated women as equals and they were always allowed, expected to, there was no problem if they wanted to say something in a meeting um, and were, you know, again, treated as equals. So there were more than the usual number of Quakers. Lucretia Mott was another one. She was at the Seneca Falls, which where we'll be in a bit, I think. Um, and this is a reminder that there were women who, these are the ladies' tailors, um, that a lot of the women had not only wanted to vote, to get the right to vote, they wanted to the right to have an equal salary and better hours and all that kind of thing. And there, even then. Even, yeah, <laughs> even then. Yeah. And especially, you know, there's some very sad things written about the, the women who lived, in, or who worked in the, the mills at Lowell and Lawrence because not, they weren't actually women, a lot of them. A lot of them were like 12 years old, 11 years old, worked probably six and a half days, if not more. Had no, if you got hurt, then you were let go. I mean, absolutely no rights and horrible conditions. If you, has anybody ever been to the Slater's Mill in Pawtucket? You have, yeah. I think the guide, when, when I went, talked about how the they hired five and six year old boys to climb underneath this equipment. You look at the things going around and it's like, oh my God. And they would, um, they'd have to crawl under in order to change some vital part. And they were right there with these things. They didn't turn the machine off. They just let it run. And he said, and often boy could lose his finger, you know, whatever. And that was it. He was out of there. No such thing as insurance or anything and and for a six-year-old boy that could you had to be able to work and if you didn't have a thumb or you lost your hand or whatever it was like you know what you were going to do so what, yeah 
and I don't know what, it's really awful. So, um, but they're making progress, I guess, here. <laughs> <laughs> that the, I, I had to figure out what's the opposition on the bottom. They're, they're not being very polite right now, but that's all right, <laughs> rolling over the opposition. Um, they had newspapers, a couple of different newspapers, and so this is a sophisticated operation. This is not just a, you know, a couple of ladies trying to get things together. Uh, some, some husbands, of course, would be supportive, and some husbands were not, but I think at a certain point, the women pretty much, at least a number of them, said to their husband, I'm doing this, you know, period. But it was unheard of. Women didn't speak out in public occasions. There was one of the abolitionist speakers, a woman in Boston, was terrific, but she was so good that the men said she should not be speaking, and she was tired of having crowds of people jeering at her, so she left Boston. She said, I can't even stay here anymore because I'm not able to speak and say what I want to say. So um, Hartford, I mean, this was, yeah, this is, so that's obviously the White House. Can you read that, or should I? President Wilson. Yeah. Oh. President Wilson is deceiving the world when he appears as the prophet of democracy. President Wilson has opposed those who demand democracy for, his, for this country. He is responsible for disenfranchising of millions of Americans. We in America know this. The world will find him out. So. You know what I don't know now that I'm thinking about? It, I don't know how long this went on. It was over years, but I didn't think to look up. Well, we know what the end was when they got the right to vote, so we can, we'll get to that. So now, I, and I also don't understand this because we were just talking about this. With all that they said about Wilson, he said, this is the time to support women's, so I have no well, idea. Later. Maybe, maybe it was, he was out. running for election. Well, they couldn't vote yet. Yeah, maybe he had a, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> realization or something. The men, um, some men were supportive. They also, when, when any of the parades and that were happening, you might see a picture of where there's a booth. I think maybe that's over here. There was a booth that said, all opponents of women's suffrage, you know, gather here. <laughs> so, and of course they were all men. Um, so they're out in one of their marches. I, this is, I'm guessing it was down Fifth Avenue because that was where many of the, many of the marches were. And, uh, you know, I can't believe they just got themselves all done up in white dresses. <laughs> and I, you know, and carried their signs and, and most likely were hearing all kinds of boos and horrible language from the, the people who were watching. And this is where often the New York police were brutal pulled them in when they were in jail. Sometimes they were arrested officially, sometimes they were just left in jail with, you know, nobody caring and watching. Or, but, and they also were force fed. I can't, you know, I can't, well. <laughs> so, um, a little bit of a different <laughs> look at the women. She doesn't have her white dress on right now, but, um, and I thought, you know, I think maybe this is World War I because it says ammunition up there. It's, it's from a publication. UAWCIO. Oh, okay. Oh, let me see that. Okay. International Education. Oh, up Department. there. Oh, good. So they were. Rosie the River. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay, so. They don't have uh, Oh, okay. I don't know if I need them or not, but we'll see. Uh, you know, a lot of them, I mean, I don't really have to say too much about. I mean, they're pretty obvious. Um, I think this is out the outside the White House, too, at least, or they all have the same kind of picket fence. Maybe that's it. But rain or shine, I think. And I always wondered, I mean, I thought that looked like a man with a mustache, but maybe not. I think it is. Oh, so, well, good for him. There he is. Yeah. He, all right, um, and this was, uh, I think we saw this before, this is a, just a reminder that at the same time, there were lots of other, the early 1900s and late 18, the time of a lot of social upheaval, one of which was prohibition. So um, 
and it was that was very um, religiously oriented, I would say. I mean, it was a lot of the churches who were particularly uh, wanting to get rid of alcohol, um, and they did. I was watching. There's one of those. Um, I don't know. On Channel Two, there's a program of, of thing about pro, uh, about prohibition, and my younger son, who's in his 40s, <laughs> had never heard of prohibition. <laughs> you know, I couldn't believe it. And I, and I said, you know, people weren't allowed to drink, and but then they had these places where they would serve it anyway, and all that. He was just stunned. How could you? How could you ever do that? <laughs> he said. I mean, it's not because he drinks a lot or anything. Just it's such a stunning notion at this time. But my parents met in Chicago in the 20s, middle 20s, and um, all that I ever heard of their courtship was they went to speakeasies <laughs> <laughs> with good music. They had a lot of good, what they called black and tan clubs, which meant that there were um, black people and white people together, and that, you know, good black bands and music, and they were in the black and tan clubs and apparently never got found out or arrested or anything. And those were the days of Al Capone and the whole, the whole schmear. So, um, so there were lots of other causes going on. And uh, this one is, says, um, a million voters are asking for pure food, factory inspection, um, this sounds familiar. Child labor laws, pure milk, abolition of the white slave trade, and uniform laws. And then these are the women voters and the women's suffrage plank, their legislative plank. And this was um, the official newspaper of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which is one of the, that's what it says at the top. So they're, you know, they really had their act together on this stuff. I don't know where they got the money, but they did. So, uh, and this, the Women's Franchise comes to St. James. I mean, you can read that. Free for all, I guess they're having a meeting of some sort. How about the hats? <laughs> oh, dear. And they're out around town, uh, you know, putting up posters and, and everything. I mean, there's just, it was a total, total effort. I mean, they weren't just coming out on Monday morning. This was it. Now this one certainly looks like this woman is voting. So um, I don't have any other information about it, but I, you know, maybe it's the first time a woman voted here or whatever. But when, so when would have been the first year that they could have voted? Anybody know when we finally won the yeah, well, 20 actually was. Weren't there states? Uh, yeah, yeah, there were. There were, I th and I thought I had a list of those. Um, well, this map, yeah, um, without looking at that, I know that some states, well, first of all, some of the colonies had in their constitution the right for women to vote from the very beginning, but they took it out right away as soon as they discovered it was in there. <laughs> so who got that in there? So, but some, and, and so a lot of these states, the, the West was doing better. They were new and, and, you know, they didn't have this whole history behind them. And so, um, but the, I mean, the first point is that they, they would, uh, they would have it and then they'd take it away and then they'd win it again and they'd take it away and sometimes they were given the right to only vote at school elections you know the women get to take care of the schools and the rest of the business is left up to the men but this when I remember looking at this um, can you maybe read that yeah King Library Special Collection oh no I'm sorry this yeah this map shows the progress of oh. women's suffrage and the different types of voting that women were allowed to exercise oh, okay. in Kentucky, for instance. Women were able to vote at school board elections at the time of this map. Although white on the left, they had full, full voting yeah. rights. This is by what year, to say? And the, uh, and the full dark, they had no yeah. rights at all. Yeah. So that was all on the East Coast. What year was this? That's right. Doesn't it doesn't this say what year. 
Let's see if I... Huh. Um, I had, and I had this before, but, um, no, I would say it's, it's certainly, I mean, it's by the, it has to be in the, into the 1900s. I mean, nothing was really happening, except, now, here's one of the great questions. So who was the first woman elected to the U.S. Congress? It's like trivia time, but it isn't trivial at all. Yes. Very good. Jeanette Rankin from? Maine? No, out here somewhere. I think, um, I don't think it was Colorado, maybe Wyoming. I thought I'd written it down, but it was a Midwestern, a, a, a Western state. What? It's interesting that the East Coast was so, so bad. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, and then, and then they, like, they, they put in an amendment saying you could vote, and then the next year they decided you couldn't. <laughs> Pretty terrible. So, um, well, New York. Look at so New York actually allowed. This is the one white and and what is that? Michigan, and Arkansas, but it kind of, and you know some of the states that these days we might not think of as being progressive. <laughs> the one with the dots. Oh. Oh, can the you do that? Yeah. On municipal suffrage. Okay. And then the next one to the right of that is uh, municipal suffrage in certain in certain city, charter cities. Uh -huh. in certain cities. And on the right, the dark absolute slack has no such at all. Yeah. And we're in the we've got some dots anyway. We're in dots. Yeah. <laughs> If anybody who knows, you know, some answers to this that I don't know, please say so. Um, all right, so that's the map. Oh, I could have read it from down here, but it's good for Gail to do that. Oh, I like this one. That's, and that's a great thought, you know, that women's cause is man's. And we rise and they rise and fall together. I really like that. I know. They, and you know, I think I love this picture. <laughs> I'm crazy about the hats. They all apparently have the same hat on. This great little decorated, I mean, it's really great. And it's the young, it says Young People's, Georgia Young People's yeah. Suffrage Association. But yeah. oh, they're having such a good time and they look so terrific. So, Makes you wonder what they were doing when they weren't making posters <laughs> and places to go in parades. I think the hats may be about the same. Um, there's also a picture that I, I didn't put in, but that looks very much like this, except it says at the top, men opposed to, <laughs> to the vote, to suffrage, and it just has, in front it has the whole row of men, you know, in the back looking in at how you could oppose this thing. But so they're out um, with their booths and with their newspapers. So the, the um, headline here, which I'm sure you can read, maybe not too far away, parade struggles to victory despite disgraceful, disgraceful scenes. Um, the small print, this nation aroused to open I by open insults to women, cause wins popular sym sympathy, Congress orders investigation, striking object lesson. That means, but so, th and this is 1912, so things were getting pretty rough. And that's a sad cartoon. It, and it's also there to remind me that um, in this day, before television and all that other stuff, cartoons were, were um, very, not even called, I mean, they weren't cartoony. They were definitely like, we still have some that are political. And a lot of the political messages got put over by something like this. And because it, it, for a while, it wasn't true that everybody could read either. We have to remember that. 
and maybe especially women who weren't allowed to go to school sometimes at past, you know, some early grade. So, um, and I think that was true in the Civil War. There's a very famous cartoonist who did a whole lot of things. I'll do that next time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I think the next picture is actually the same as this without the big suffrage right to, oh no, yeah, no it isn't. Well, anyway, you get the picture. More parading. Does anybody recognize Fifth Avenue enough to think that that might be Fifth Avenue? But they did gather in New York. I mean, the thing that you could you could get more people, and then the news from New York. I don't know what they did in Boston. I actually haven't even thought to find out. But that would be interesting. But it was it was still you know it was like the center of a lot. And if you did something in New York, then it got covered and sent around the country and and all that. This was 2015. 2015? That could be. 1915. 1915. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 I thought, however you can be right. Boy, am I way off here. <laughs> Just take me home now. <laughs> okay, 1915, yes. <laughs> Yes, right, that's right, right. So, in 1915, and here's another, another one, um, I don't think we know when and we know what the messages are, but just, you know, it was over and over again. This is, this is, I don't, does anybody know what she would be? She's some Greek or Roman goddess or, or somebody who, you know. Yeah. The children involved, too, over the Yeah. Sometimes Columbia. Oh, okay. yeah, with the flag in the back. They were big on pageants. Yes, and the, the eagles up on top. The, that is something else, isn't it? Either that or she's a Norse god. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, oh, it's too bad. It really is so much clearer on here. She's, I think she, I'm trying to see if she's young. The kids were there. All right, and here's the, the White House again, the favorite. You know, it must be longer now. They, they, they've added on to it, haven't they? Isn't the White House, doesn't it go out like that more? Do we know what that says? President. Mr. President, how long must oh. women wait? For, for liberty. liberty. Oh. And this one, um, this is interesting. I mean, if particularly because for those of us who might have been at the League of Women Voters at some point, which used to be in Southborough when I moved in, mm -hmm. we were the area league with Northborough and Westborough, I think. But it was a strong group, and um, they actually, before I got here, they had done a lot of studies. If a town needed to study something, you could call on the league, and they'd do the research and present reports when women got to stay home. <laughs> do things more than maybe they do now. but So this apparently was the, the beginning of that. And they have their, you can, it says child welfare, education, home and high prices, women in colorful, ocu gainful occupations, <laughs> colorful, public health and morale, independent citizenship for married women. Very interesting, that was, yeah, well, I don't know about that, but you couldn't do anything. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't own property, you couldn't sue, you couldn't do anything legal. Um, so that, I mean, at one point I wanted to say that, it, notice this is women's rights, but it's not equal rights. I mean, because we have a whole other protest movement later on for equal rights that some of you may have been in, who knows. Um, we'll end up with that. So beat it, who? Huh. What is that? What do you think? W O. Well, whatever it says. While the beating is good. Oh, well, maybe. Oh, could be. Yeah. Is that? Oh, well, yeah. Because the he was a college professor, wasn't he? So he's got on his cap, um, and he's saying, "Stop! You are not in the Democratic platform." <laughs> so, 
Wow, and they have, they're, they're oh, it's gone. They were, they, were, they were holding up babies up there on the top of that big wave. Um, women's sphere, of course, that was the big thing. Women's sphere was home, and um, you weren't supposed to do anything outside of that home. With the, certainly nothing like make a, a scene for yourself out, even, and even with the baby carriage. Um, so women devotes her time to gossip and clothes, of course, because she has nothing else to talk about. <laughs> Give her broader interests and she will, and then there's a word below the hat, to be vain and frivolous. So apparently if she goes any further than that, she'll be vain and frivolous. That would be just horrendous, right? So, try this glass sister, the glass being a mirror, and she's looking, I can't see what it says, but the suffrage, I mean this is trying to convince, apparently the front woman is not interested in suffrage and the other one is, so yeah, she's trying to anti. convert her, what? The ribbon on the woman's seated was anti. Oh, okay, anti-suffrage, yep, yep, doesn't say the whole thing, but that's right. So the she's... Women, though, weren't they dependent on husbands, but if you were a teacher, there were contracts that said that you, you could couldn't. marry and continue to teach. Yeah. Almost everywhere you couldn't marry. Yeah. If you married, you had to quit. Right. Yeah. I mean, even when I started teaching, which was not <laughs> this far back, but... Um, I think you could teach. This was in Greenfield, Massachusetts, which is not so. I, th I think if you were, if you became pregnant, you had to go home. Before it had been if you, but the first teachers association I ever went to in Greenfield was about, you know, always about pay. And the men were saying that they should be paid more because they, the women all had husbands to support them. Well, I didn't. <laughs> so, but that was, that was in the last century out in the middle of the last century. That was still, I was stunned. I'm sitting there thinking, they're kidding me. <laughs> I'm not supposed to make as well, much money as they do. Yeah. yeah it wasn't just so, um, the bottom it, of that says, last week, as long as I count the votes, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> 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 yeah. So. It was a cartoonist that you were talking about. Oh yes, maybe I don't definitely. Know word nasty yeah, that's right. There are whole books of his things, I think. <laughs> so um, the ballot in counting there is strength, and I don't know why Boss Tweet's saying it, but that is what matters. So that's. Um, what he's saying it, or he's just telling it. Um, well. No, as long as he has his arm on the counter, he can counter it any way he wants. Oh, I see. That's what matters. Oh, I see. Oh. All right. All right. So. Um, I just put a couple of things here. Good. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> do. How about questions? And and I also want to be sure that um, there are a number of things over here. There are a couple that are handouts. Uh, one of the things that I haven't mentioned is that in addition to doing this research, which I haven't been doing very long, but because it was, we were having an election and I was interested in the issue, but, um, but I do research, you know, on my own and then sometimes find somebody who wants to support it a little, but I'm, I'm researching African American women who were left out of the history books. I mean, and I, I've been doing this for a couple of years and when I have a chance I go look up some more and I am stunned is too light a word for how many there are that, that have done amazing things, even to this day. Um, you know, the first person who did this kind of nursing at Mass General, um, it, it, all kinds of occupations, some people who were incredibly wonderful performers, poets. There's a, a sculptress who has sculptures in, outside in Boston. and. Um, also, there was a, a woman named Phyllis Wheatley who was very young and a, a wonderful poet, got to be enough. So her, 
she was a slave, but her owner uh, paid for her to publish. And I think her book was the first book of, this was during, obviously, way in the past. I think her book was the first book written by an African-American, maybe a poet. But you're nodding your head, do you, do you no, know? No, I just knew it, that was true, but she's kind of famous. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and it's, it's fascinating. There, I mean, there's a woman who, there's an astronaut and any number of teachers and, of course, a lot of, um, I mean, we know the names of performers and maybe actresses and that, but um, I'm, that's what, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm <laughs> working on that. And I went to, I, I went to the Tufts Library, which is a, a dream because they let alums take books out. And I looked in, well, actually, I was probably home when I typed out or printed out like all the books under that were under African American women and just pages and pages and pages I I didn't know what I was getting into <laughs> I think that usually happens but um, anyway sometime I might do something about about that because um, there are a lot of women who deserve to have their names known to us and and they aren't so how about questions or or thoughts about this I'll ask you one question first. If, I assume that some of you have children, and I wonder if the kids in, in, in their history classes, in high school anyway, has anybody ever talked about suffrage or women voting or? Really? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, ancient Civ, and then by the time they get up towards the 1920s centuries, they just the stop. War, they, just, well, they, they run out of days, I think, is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they need another year. Then. <laughs> I actually, um, well, I won't say this. I'll wait till the the video's gone. <laughs> I'll say something. But I am very interested and very concerned in general about how it's very hard to teach history and to teach what's happening today. And, and I'm concerned that I think a lot of what's happening today is because we haven't been able to convey to the next generation what democracy is and how you, you know, what rights you have and what rights you don't have. And that, and I, I'm really worried. I'm really worried because there seem to be not enough people who understand what it is to have rights and not rights that, you know, mean that nobody else has them. You Ernie. were talking about uh, progress, and this is at the turn of the century. Uh, do you see a lot of progress? Do you see, uh, you talked about them making fun of the suffragettes. Uh, there's some fellow named Trump, I think is his name, and he <laughs> had some rather unpleasant things to say about uh, candidates who were actually running for president now, mm -hmm. and uh, that didn't seem too fair. It seems like women still, uh, some people get paid very, very little. You talked about the uh, being the, uh, the problem of defining women as persons. Uh, these days, you get corporations defined as persons, and uh, women and blacks other groups being defined as mm -hmm. nothing. So I really, uh, that doesn't seem, I'm reading an answer to your mind, <laughs> but to me it seems that uh, there's a lot of uh, slow motion, <laughs> very slow motion, and in some cases almost in the opposite direction. You talked about uh, Slater Mill and people were in the number of percentage of people in uh, unions in private companies, I think it's like 7%, which is a pretty small number in unions. And uh, it just seems like to me there is progress, but yeah. it seems at the same time there's uh, stepping backwards in many ways too. It's very, it's very hard. And uh, just on the union thing, that, that some of the first unions were started by those women of Lowell. Mm -hmm. And who who just decided it was time to walk out, 
and so I think I mean that was the good news then. But but looking at things now, I I don't know. I mean I'm um, I like to think that there are a lot of things that we do have that I mean obviously we can vote and we can own property and and that there are still ways that women, you know, the pay thing, which is problem still, I guess for a lot of people anyway. Well, where, but did, where did those textile mills? Go. Didn't they go south first yes, because they went south. they're yeah. seeking lower yeah. wages? And now uh, they go even further. Um, high tech companies go to Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, jobs are lost here, and mm -hmm. children in India and Bangladesh and other right. places work long hours mm -hmm. for American companies. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if I if I I could get really depressed <laughs> very, very easily. Um, I've been following the election stuff very closely, and I can't believe most of it. But I mean, we that's a whole other conversation. But I I am concerned when I said I think that people don't understand or haven't been taught their history. That a lot of those people seem to be the ones that are reacting the mostly to some of the horrible things that, you know, when you accuse someone else or make fun of them or allow them to be dragged out somewhere. But um, it's interesting. I mean, I think we all know that, but it's hard. I'm very aware that I'm saying this in public and then, you know, should I do that? <laughs> but I can't believe that there are too many of us who think that what's going on right now is a very good ex example of American democracy. And I really do, I mean, the reason I started out wanting to be a history teacher and I did civics for a while and um, because I wanted people to understand that this is, you know, this is an amazing country and, um, and you, but you need to know. I, Thomas Jefferson had my favorite quote is something to the effect that, um, oh, the, the, the life of democracy or the existence of democracy or how long it will last or whatever it depends on having an, an informed citizenry. Mm -hmm. And boy, I don't think we have a very informed citizenry right now. And he, he's totally right. If you, if you don't have people who understand the concept of other people's rights and how to have a conversation with someone and disagree, it's not easy, and sometimes voices get raised and everything, but we've certainly gone beyond the point where it, it sounds like a democracy. Yes? When you say people don't know history, or you're concerned that they don't, I know I'm mangling this expression about the people who, I guess, it's if you don't know the history and you to repeat it, I know that's not quite right, but. No, I think it is, well, yeah. <laughs> certainly is the idea of it, yes. I mean, I agree with you, women are going backwards. Yeah. A lot of people are going backwards. And nobody seems to care. Not well, women don't. I was just gonna say I'm I'm a mother of two boys that are in their thirties. One one's married and has a girlfriend. And I do have to say that they are becoming energized during this election and it happens to be with Bernie Sanders. And I think they he's finding those young people that are showing oh, yeah. interest. Yeah. So, you know, I felt the same way you did for a while, but when I saw these young people, you know, take on this, this cause and feel like they had a voice and they wanted to have this voice, it, it does mm -hmm. kind of reassure me that mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to say that no one no, cares, right, but, right. They, but you know, but you know, they, they have to be brought on by someone who makes them feel like they can do something about it. And, and, yeah. I, and I really feel that that's how they're, they're looking at it right now. Uh, so. Well, and I also think that older people can respond negatively to some of the stuff that's happening mm -hmm. and start to rebel against people like us who have had a, a nicer history mm -hmm. and we see what's going on now, it makes us mad. So know, how do we rebel? You know, the, the, the young people are coming in new, but some of the yeah. older people could come in and just say, no, you know, we, can't, we can't tolerate this type of behavior. It's not what we're about. Then we don't know what to do about it. I mean, what, you know, I, <clears throat> I write a column for the villager every other week. I've I, I used to write more about politics, not this year, but um, <clears throat> but whenever I mentioned the word Democrat, I get a letter from somebody saying, and I quote, I don't like to quote it, but I will, that I was just one of those people who wanted to tear the baby out of mother's wombs. 
I never mentioned abortion. I wouldn't be, whatever it would take, ignorant enough to have a column where I argued one side of that issue. That's, that's a no-win thing. But that I happened to mention the word Democrat then. Uh, and I just got tired of that. So I wrote one column which is called Call Me a Fuddy Duddy. And it's about um, how do I, s I have a whole bunch of grandchildren, the youngest are six and 10. How do I talk to them about the election? Would we dare even watch anything going on? And they go to school and hopefully they're learning some other vision of it, but, but I, I have no idea what to say to them. Their parents actually, the parents of, of those two, um, I don't think they watch regular TV. They have, like, you know, you can push all the buttons for Disney. <laughs> Not my favorite thing, but it sure beats the news. <laughs> so, you know, what do you do with kids? And so, and I remembered a time when we were rather uncivil in this town when we were voting on Algonquin. Yes, yes. And we should, if you didn't live here then, we were, was it the question of do we have separate schools? It was a small group, it turned out a very small group in Southboro who wanted to have a separate school from Algonquin and let Northboro go. And it was a very, very hard, the, the hardest thing I've seen in this town. And it turned out in the end that there were very few people who voted for it. We went to a whole lot of fuss, but there was a, it wasn't exactly a website, but like we could write in. And so I wrote in a couple times saying something like, well, anyway, whatever I said. And so somebody wrote <laughs> about me. They said, Donna McDaniel should stop writing, um, writing those things before she embarrasses, it. or she's getting seen now. She's embarrassing herself. Listen, that was I was 20 years younger. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but uh, but people said things like, "Oh, go hide your head under a rock." That was their answer to some comment about why we should have a. It was a heart. And so I wrote what I'd written at one point was, "Do you want your children to read this? Are you proud of what we're teaching them about how we do democracy?" But we're we're not doing so well these days. So I'm sure that. You know, maybe we should just have a discussion <laughs> about what's going on. But I thank you. Are there any other things about, I hope that you've learned something about women's suffrage. And um, appreciate, I know that you do appreciate that we can still vote and express our opinions and, and all of that. And, uh, you know, probably my grandmother, maybe my mother wouldn't have been able to speak the way that I can. So we are blessed and we need to I think then we have an obligation to use that blessing to share it with other people somehow we'll see but thank you for coming it's very very good and uh, this will be thanks to Trevor our faithful camera person this will be on YouTube so if you're there you, it's just the back of your head so just worry about me <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know how long it takes for that, but you know, under Southboro Access Media, which is such a gift. I also, a little commercial, I don't know, like I get paid. <laughs> so that's funny. Um, I did one on town meeting a couple years ago, Southboro Town Meeting with Donna McDaniel. I didn't make up the title. But I went to Woodward and walked around, I mean somebody was there, walked around just explaining. You know, the moderator stands here, he does that, this is where and how we run our town meeting, because I think a lot of people don't know, especially new people. And so that, that's still on. That's been watched by maybe more than 100 people. That's probably my all-time high. <laughs> and then a couple months ago, I did one called From Cows to Computers, Southboro in the 70s, because, um, and it has lots of really good newspaper clippings in it, because when I moved in in, the, in 1972, it was a small town with dairy farms, about 5,000 people, you know, nice little self-government puttering around and doing things. And by the, by the 1980, then, we had uh, changed some of the structure of town government, combined some departments, created the transfer station, which at that time was, people would say, what's a transfer station? <coughs> um, built a couple schools and had um, 10,000, almost 10,000 people. So in that one decade, and one of my points was that the planning board and other town officials and, and citizen committees, I mean they're all citizens, really put a lot of effort into making this the town that it is today. I mean, people move in, they think, well, that's nice, or I could do better, 
or whatever, but they really, I think they created a town that's still functioning and we still, I mean, very well, and but we still have shared problems. So thank you again for being here. Makes it all worthwhile. <laughs>